see that you're there. I hope you're feeling better today. You said you weren't feeling too good yesterday, and there's Miss Pam, and it's good to have you on board on this bright and sunny, and it is sunny in Portland on this 20, what is it, 28th day of uh, December, 25, 26, yeah, 28th day, December 2020. What a wonderful, wonderful day this is. By the way, and good morning, Miss Carolyn. I thought I would pop something up here for you that I received uh, just yesterday uh, in my email. Good morning, Miss Terry. Are you getting all packed up to come home now? Let's see, we're getting close to it. Should be from, you know, at any rate, let's see if you all, how many of you know who that is? All right. Do you see them there? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is, and uh, that is the Keffer clan, and Mary Alice said that uh, she was going to share one of her presents with us, and that's what she got. She said, We're not great on pictures, but there's all the kittles in the Keffer household, all right. So I thought I would put that up there for uh, a smile for many of you that remember Gary and Mary Alice and the kids, uh, so, ooh. I'll remove that now. All right. Well, good morning. Let's see. Gloria popped in. I uh, hope it's sunny at the coast as it is here. Uh, Sherry is there. Terry, Carolyn, Pam, Donna, I mentioned. All right. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump in. We had a great day yesterday, and I thank you all for your faithfulness. Good morning, Miss Sue. It's good to have you on board this morning as well. Uh, but we did. We had a great time, and the responses were were uh, just really precious, and I thank you. I thank you for joining in worship together. Uh, be much in prayer as we're hoping that everybody's going to be getting back up on their feet and feeling well enough that we can get the, the team going and rolling again. Uh, they all should pretty much be on the back side. It's been over 10 days. Good morning, Miss Cynthia and household. It's good to have Dale and Cynthia and uh, Ryan uh, aboard with us as well. Well, this week, uh, we're looking really forward, I think, to closing out 2020, but then we'll be opening up a whole new chapter in 2021. 
I don't want anybody to get their, their hopes up because I got a feeling that when the clock strikes midnight uh, on, on Thursday night, that there's not going to be a whole lot of change in the world. It isn't going to be all of a sudden, you know, a little pixie dust flying around and everything is made good and everything is made wonderful. Uh, we will go to bed with the same, we'll wake up in the morning with the same problems we went to bed with at the night before. But there's just something about turning that calendar that, uh, well, for the most part, I think, you know, everybody's thinking, all right, the old is dead. We're going to bring in the new, and uh, it's all going to be better. Of course, most of us have lived long enough that we understand that that's a nice cartoon, but uh, uh, life is life. It is what it is. But I want us to look at five imperatives uh, this week that we need to practice so that no matter what happens in the coming year, we'll enjoy the blessings that the Lord gives us. And uh, every year is uh, is a new experience with, with new uh, challenges and uh, new mercies. In fact, does the scripture tell us that his mercies is new every day? Uh, let's face it, how many of us had any idea on December 28th, uh, 2019, uh, that this year would unfold the way that it has? I don't think that any of us in our wild uh, imaginations could have expected or, or uh, uh, predicted the kind of year that we have had. But think about it. In the midst of all the upheaval, look at what God has done for us. You see, we can look at the, the negative, we can look at all the bad things, and certainly some terrible things you know, have happened you know, to us uh, individually, collectively, uh, as a, a church, as families, as, as a nation. But God has still been at work. A number of people have come into the kingdom, been born again, living for Christ now. A whole lot of folks have uh, had their world shaken and they've turned back to God. And they've gotten off that uh, roller coaster and off that slide and that drift. And they've reaffirmed their commitment to Christ and God is doing great things. Uh, in the midst of all that's gone on, God has just done some wonderful things. He made, we, we came to a point last March, I believe the 15th, that we made a course correction with absolutely no understanding of how anything works. And truthfully, we're still learning. I remember the first Sunday after they locked everything down, our first broadcast service, in fact, our first three, I believe, were done on a, a, a cell phone, iPhones and, and, and uh, I think Samsungs. It was done on a cell phone. Uh, put on a, you know, a funny little, you know, cell phone holder and, uh, and manipulated. We met around the piano and we, we experimented with some things. And uh, the broadcast was sketchy and it was uh, uh, start and stop. It was uh, uh, buffering constantly. But you all held in there. Then we got the camera. Didn't really improve all that much. So we upgraded our, our uh, Wi-Fi in the church. Uh, but we were still you know, on, on regular copper wiring. And uh, it didn't mu do much either because there were still the glitches and the, and, and, and the buffering. We brought in fiber optic. That helped. We ran it hardline into the router. That corrected a lot of the problems. But it, it, it was a, a, a constant test of trial and error. You all stuck in there. You all hung in tenaciously. And I've been so blessed by that. It's been remarkable what God has done the open doors that, uh, that he has given us. Going from, you know, our, our physical site, you know, here in Tiger, to branching out to across the world. I would have never thought it, would you? And when we move through 2021, 20, I am 
absolutely positive of this. There will be more course corrections that we'll need to make. If our heart and lives are where they need to be, we will hear God and we will move in the direction that he's leading. So I want to share these five imperatives with you and I'll piggyback on some of this probably next Sunday as we open up the new year. But five imperatives that I think form what must be in 2021 in order to get in on what God wants and not miss joining him in what he's doing. It's a great privilege to be able to join God in anything and everything that he wants to do. So I would share with you the very first imperative that we will look at is, is simply this. Well, I, I keep that up there so it keeps you reminded, but is be consecrated. It'll come under the title of be. What are we going to be? Well, let's be consecrated. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that uh, this is a brand new day. A day given to us as a gift that we may give it back to you in service. How great and how wonderful is that. Lord, we love you with all our heart. We come and we lay ourselves before you and we seek you to be our, our guide, our teacher, to Holy Spirit to lead us into wisdom and in truth. Open up to us the very heart and thought of God. No one knows the mind of God but the Spirit of God. You put that Spirit in us that we might have the mind of Christ. So, Lord, we are here with ears open, hearts open, lives open, asking you to teach us. Lead us, guide us where we need to be. And, Lord, give us the courage, the boldest that we need to put everything else away and just embrace your truth and then live it out. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sue, that's such a sweet sentiment. Thank you. Sue said we are blessed to have you and God working for us. Well, I love you. It's the greatest privilege that Sherry and I have had in, in our lives is to be able to first of all serve Christ but to be able to serve him through this body you are precious precious people let's move forward excuse me if I sound a little stuffy today I am stuffy today so if I sound it that is because I am all right uh, a serious study of the word of God will lead you to the conclusion that when God works he works through consecrated people before God made his covenant with Abraham and we've studied some of this when we were back in Hebrews, if you remember right. God set him apart, and Abraham consecrated himself to the purposes of God. In fact, that's a very real sense of what, uh, what happens in, in, in the word at the Passover. Passover was an act of consecration. Uh, it was an act of setting aside those who were under the blood uh, before God brought them out of bondage. And you remember when we were in Joshua, before Israel ever crossed the Jordan and entered into the Promised Land, what God said to them. If you remember, he gave specific instructions. He said that Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Friends, this isn't just an Old Testament truth. This truth permeates the New Testament as well. We see it in, in Christ's call of the disciples as he sets them apart as his followers. We see it in the preparation of the church on the day of Pentecost as they were to set themselves aside and wait before the Lord. We find it in the activity of the first church during and after their first rounds of persecution. We see it in the church of Antioch when they set Barnabas and, and Paul aside for the cause of worldwide missions. In fact, I believe that the history of God's working is a long, unbroken line that includes uh, God revealing himself to those he intends to work through. And then he calls them to be part of, of, of what it is, that glorious work that he's going to do. And he demands that they consecrate themselves to him that he might work through them. And then God works through those who are thoroughly given over to him, consecrated to him. 
It's been that way throughout Scripture, but it's been that way throughout church history. You can look at every person that God has raised up in, in great ways, and that pattern is the same. It's the same for individuals. It's the same for churches. God wants to work. So he reveals himself to the church. He calls us to be a part of that glorious work. We partner with him and with us. He demands that we set ourselves aside for him, that he might work through us. And then as we're given over to him, we begin to see him working in and through us in, in amazing ways. So briefly, what does it look like when we talk about consecrating ourselves to God? Well, it consists of a spiritual purification that, uh, and, and, and in turning a heart to God in faith and trust in his promises and in, a, in, in willing obedience to his commands. It means laying our heart open to God in such a way that it would allow the miracle of grace to unfold as God works in and through us. I want to unfold this truth a little bit by looking at just one beautiful incident of such consecration that we are given in detail in Scripture. You will remember that David had a, an earnest desire to build a house unto the Lord. But God didn't permit him, did he? He didn't because Scripture says he was a man of war. In First Chronicles, David's explaining, he says, Then King David rose to his feet and said in verse 2, Listen to me, my brethren and my people. I had intended to build a permanent home for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for a footstool for our God. So I made preparation to build it. And verse 3 says, But God said to me, You shall not build a house for my name, because you are a man of war and have shed blood. You see, war and worship are not really common brothers, yet there are times, and you need to understand it, in our consecrated state where as Christians we are called to live lives that are willing to contend for the faith, willing to go to battle. That doesn't mean to shed blood, but it does mean to stand up and even sometimes take blows in the defense of the gospel. What is it that, that Jude wrote? And I, and I have grown over the last couple of years to so deeply appreciate that tiny little letter that, that, that the half-brother Jesus writes. Jude, and in verse 3, he says these words to us, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you would contend earnestly strive, wrestle, get in hand-to-hand -hand combat, as it were, earnestly for the faith, which is once for all handed down to the saints. But going back to David, David was not allowed by God to build the temple, but he did make every preparation for it. David committed much of the preparation uh, uh, by, by means of his abundance of wealth that God had blessed him with. There are many uh, whose interest in the things of God decrease because they're not permitted to, by God to do a particular work that they desire to do. That wasn't the case with David. His passion for God didn't wane when God wouldn't allow him to do as he pleased. I've seen it over the years when, when somebody has wanted to do something and they wanted a position or they wanted something and it didn't happen for them, that pretty soon, well, if I, can't, if, if I can't get my way, if I can't do it my way, I'll take my ball and go home. Their, their service to God, their, their devotion to God, their love for God begins to wane. Some people become slack or slothful in their efforts to do the work needed to be done because they, like David, have not been permitted to have their own way. Still, there are some who, if, if not asked, would be content to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. You know, one of the marks of maturity in, in one of the conferences Sherry and I led, there was a, a, a video that we used, and in it, the uh, the individual said one of the marks of maturity, and, and and he listed some very simple things: being able to carry ten dollars in your pocket and not spend it, uh, see some dirty socks lay on the floor and not step over it, but pick them up and and 
put them in the hamper. See dirty dishes on the counter and go ahead and wash them and put them away. Don't wait to be instructed. You know, just simple things like that were marks of maturity. Well, I think that can simply apply spiritually as well to the mark of a mature believer. You see a job that needs to be done. You don't wait for somebody to come along and do it. You take care of it. Why? Because you're there. You notice it. You see it. And let me give you a, a, a hint. When you see something and you notice something, instead of running and finding somebody to take care of it, take care of it yourself. Why? Because God let you see it. God revealed that to you. God showed you. Now, are there times that you may not be skilled or you may not be capable of doing a particular job? Certainly there are. And at that point, yes, you reach out to somebody that is skilled, is, is able to take care of that which you are not. But how many times have people said, well, uh, you know, they, they come to you or they come to a deacon or a Sunday school teacher to me and say, listen, I got a friend that needs to know the Lord. Would you go witness to him? Listen, if they see a friend in need that needs to know Christ, then, then, then God has shown you that. Get up and go witness to him. And if you think you need help, if you think you need somebody to, to train your teacher, then go to that person and say, hey, will you come with me while I, while I stumble my way through this and help me to witness to this person? That's maturity. That's God showing you something to be done that you can do. Let's examine this passage of Scripture and learn lessons that will help us become more consecrated as believers and enable us to help do the work that Christ is going to do through us in this present time. Understand that the work that he gives us to do is a great work. Whatever it is, you say, oh, that's so simple. That's, that's, that's so simple. You know, I remember Gloria Dinkelkamp, sweet, wonderful lady. She would be down there on, on days. Nobody would know she was there, but she was there with a bucket and a sponge cleaning out bathrooms. I was grieved by that because I, I didn't want that sweet lady. But she said, God showed me this is something I can do, and I'm doing it for his glory. You see, we need to understand that whatever God calls us to do is a great and wonderful work. It's a work unlike any other. It's a work of divine significance and carries an eternal impact, no matter what it is. If it's just simply taking the trash out of the kitchen, yeah. David recognized this truth. If you go all the way back to Second Chronicles or First Chronicles chapter twenty nine, verse one, then David, then King David said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced, and the work is great. For the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. The work is great. It needs to be done. It's, it's always great. It's, it's difficult. It's hard work to build for God. I like the way the uh, NLT puts it, uh, the New Living Translation. It says, the work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals, for the Lord God himself. Notice what David said, the temple is not for man, it's not for mere mortals, but it's for God, the Lord God himself. Whenever we build for God, we can always expect difficulties and oppression. If we build for ourselves out of, uh, uh, out of the will of God, we'll find little or no resistance. Uh, but it, scripture does tell us that all who will live godly will suffer persecution. David was anxious that God would have a house worthy of his name. He said, let us not forget, however, that God is as great as he is in the bush, if you will, as he was in the temple. The temple didn't make God great. God was great before there was ever a tabernacle. The glory today does not consist so much of the character of the house, but as the character of the occupant, and that's God. Does not the Lord desire that you and I, be, who are born again, be a house worthy of that great name? Doesn't he say, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which are of God, uh, you have of God? You're not your own, you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God, your body, your spirit, which is God's. Like the temple, David desired to build you and I are not for man, but for the Lord. 
This work requires an example to be set. In every work, there's a potential to direct by fiat or lead by example. God desires to raise up men and women whom he can inhabit so that he can live his life through them. It would be examples of the grace that is at work in us. Notice what, what, what David says in, in, uh, in chapter 29, verses 2 and 3. Again, in the New Living, using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for the building of the temple of my God. Now there's enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, as well as uh, great quantities of onyx and other precious stones, costly jewels and all kinds of fine stones and marbles. Verse 3. And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I have given all of my private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is an addition to the building materials I have already collected for his holy temple. Do you notice the word I have? Three times in that passage you said I have. I have, I have. I have prepared with all my might for the house of the Lord. I have set my affections on the house of the Lord. I have given to the house of my God. David doesn't ask for others to consecrate themselves to the Lord without having first set the example and consecrated himself. Parents, officers, teachers, all born again believers should pay, pay heed to that passage. You see, we set an example. David's example was one of love and liberality, as should ours. David sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Should not we leave others with the same example to follow? This work that, that, that God has given us demands our consecration. God desires our wholehearted devotion. He doesn't want our hearts and minds distracted by lesser things, but to keep ourselves fully consecrated to him and his purposes. In the last part of the ver fifth verse of the 29th chapter, he says, Who then is willing to consecrate his service to the Lord on, uh, uh, this day unto the Lord? This is the call for full hands and willing hearts. There are many today who would quickly and willingly fill their hands for their own personal profit. But how many are willing to seek first the kingdom of God? Peter says, tells us, you know, how we should spend the rest of our time. When he writes his first letter, he says in chapter 4, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the time already uh, for the time already past is sufficient for you to carry out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued the course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, Paul goes on to say, or Peter does, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead for the gospel or for those, uh, for this purpose. For this purpose has been preached even to those who are dead. That though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, be sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Always love, uh, uh, because love covers a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Wow. Well, this work that we are called to inspires a response to the Spirit of God. When God's at work in the life of his people, it always inspires a response from others. I believe one of the things that we have seen as God has worked through this fellowship over the course of 2020 is that, that more people are becoming, you know, and being drawn to God and giving themselves over to him. And what a blessing that is. First Chronicles, 
in chapter 29, verses 6 through 9, in this same passage, it says that the family, uh, that the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals, the captains of the army, the, and, and the king's administrative officials, all gave willingly to the construction of the temple of God. They gave about 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, uh, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. Wow! There you go, folks. They also contributed numerous precious stones which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord before the care of Jehel a descendant of Gershon. People rejoiced over the offerings, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord, and David was filled with joy. Today there's so much more that a person can give than just money. But here we see the response, which is such, uh, it w uh, was such that the, the leadership of the tribe of Israel, as they, they, they watched David, they began to, to offer willingly. And the people rejoiced, for they, for they offered willingly, and then they did. With perfect hearts, they offered willingly. The principle of wholeheartedness is needed to make service acceptable to God. They offered gold and silver and iron and precious stone. Now listen, iron may have been the least valuable, worldly speaking, of any of the things that are mentioned there. Uh, but they offered what they had. You see, friends, God only requires that we offer what he gave us, not what we don't have. He doesn't call us to do what we're not capable of doing, what we cannot do, what we're not equipped to do physically or emotionally or spiritually. He calls us to do and to give only what we have. The little guy only had a small lunch. That's all he was required to have. But look what God did with a small lunch. There would never be any lack in the house of God today if every born again, every child of God just simply gave, just offered what they had. They'd not be lacking in service or teachers or witnesses or anything if people just simply gave to God what they had. The real problem in American Christianity is that most of the uh, most of the churches is is got earthly minded instead of spiritually minded, uh, having a perfect heart or a wholehearted lifestyle. Well, there's also a uh, fruit produced from thoroughly consecrated people. Uh, boom. Sometimes it clicks and moves, sometimes it doesn't. There's always fruit produced from thoroughly consecrated people. And this is where we get to in verse 9. And then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly. They had made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart, and King David also rejoiced greatly. And they rejoiced because the offerings were given willingly with a perfect heart. That's, that's what I think is so incredible whenever we have one of these mission offerings like we're having right now and we see this thing is out of our reach and the closer we get to it, do you, do you sense the anticipation and the, the, the closer we get to that goal and, 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 and the, the want to just simply praise and exalt God and, and, and be overjoyed and rejoice because of what God is doing? Oh, yeah. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the outcome of a heart made perfect toward the Lord and His cause on the earth. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and there it is, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The happiest Christians are those who willingly fill their lives up with God. Joy becomes their, their, their power source, their, their generator, if you will. Is that what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 8.10? Then he said, go eat uh, the fat and drink the sweet and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah makes this statement in the midst of a great deal of sorrow over the reading of the book of the law. Uh, they were cut to the heart by the holiness of God and their lacking were uh, in that, that they were seeking to be right and in perfect standing with God and one another. Nehemiah encouraged them to, pointed them to the source of all strength, the very God of very gods. 
and the joy that we have in him. Have you considered that reason for such unhappiness in so many people's lives today is caused by not offering themselves up willingly to God and misery sets in? Why not allow God to have our very best in our time, our talent, our positions, our abilities as we go into 2021? I can tell you, I can dig down and probably find a little bit more of myself to give than I gave in 2020. And I pray I can find that. And I pray I can give it. We're called to a great work. And right now we're in the midst of a great work that God is doing among us, but it's going to get greater yet. We have more opportunity today than we, we have had at any other time in the life of our church. Just look at it. We've been uh, witnessing and, and, and touching our community only in and, and just a small portion, but now not our community only, but our nation and even the world in a unique way this past year. We have touched more homes in Tigard and, and, and our surrounding area in, in the last several months through, through, through what God has been doing. You see, it, it could have been a disaster. It could have been a door-closing event for us, but instead, God has broadened the tent. He's stretched out the canopy. He's driven down the stakes, and aren't we thrilled at what God is doing? People are being drawn to the mercy and the love of Christ as seen in this fellowship of believers. You have touched life after life after life. You've made it possible for us to meet the needs of of. of Dozens of people within our community. Oh, may God be praised. The work is greater than us. In fact, the, the work is greater than all of us combined because the work is of God. And God always calls us the stuff that are greater than us. Each of us need to consecrate ourselves to God and to the work that he's put before us. God is calling each of us to the purpose that is greater than ourselves. It's divine in nature. It's eternal in scope. So, what is our response going to be to his grace? Will we go into 2021 fully consecrated unto the Lord and his work? Will we say, hey, this was great so far, but Lord, we know you have more. Show us what to do. Direct our path and the Lord will walk down it. Give us a word and we'll say yes. Will that be our heart going forward? He set a pattern in us. Now let's let him flesh it out. Father, we thank you so very, very much. For the love, the mercy, the wonder, the grace, the glory, the splendor that is you. I thank you so much, Lord, that we can come together at these times every day and just put everything in the world aside and hear from you. Keep our ears open and attuned. And as we go through this day, Lord, keep our eyes and our ears open to what you're doing. And when you show us something, Lord, let us not step over that dirty sock, but let us pick it up. Let us not walk past the dirty dishes, but let us do them. In other words, Lord, let us understand if you show us something, it's something you've given us to do. If you put somebody on our heart, it's somebody you want us to reach out to. If there's, you know, whatever it is, Lord, make us simply tune in to you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I used an illustration a long time ago, and I'll close with this. That if I were to tell you that some of the most vile, horrible, wretched words and, and, and slurs and sayings have filled your home, you'd look at me real funny. But you see, it does, because in the airwaves, all the filth that is out there it being broadcast are in these airwaves. The only difference, the reason I can't hear them is that I'm not tuned into their frequency on some device to bring them in. 
Now, if I were, then all that filth could come in. But you see, all the splendor, the wonder, the glory, and the grace, and beautiful things, that's also out there. And I can hear them if I get tuned in. So if we want to hear God, let's tune in to him. And he will flood our minds and our hearts, our eyes and our ears with what he's saying and what he's doing. Get tuned in today. Maybe that'll be my motto for 2021. And we'll simply close with today. Get tuned in to the God frequency. May God bless you. See you in the morning.